Everyone that exalts himself shall be humbled, and he that humbled himself shall be exalted. Words taken from today's Holy Gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. How wondrous was that first Pentecost Sunday, the very birthday of Holy Mother Church so long ago. The membership of the church was filled with an obvious holiness. Even a certain spotlessness was manifested. There was the freshness and cleanness of a new beginning. There seemed to be only good wheat and no tares, no weeds in the fields of the church. This pristine community of believers, united in faith, hope, and love, showed forth a perfect unity, a perfect unity that reversed all the divisions so present during the time of the Tower of Babel. Laxity lukewarmness, sensuality, infidelity, and vice had no place, it seemed, among the disciples of the Lord in that upper room. On that first Pentecost Sunday, the Holy Ghost came as a mighty wind and as tongues of fire to enlighten and to inflame. And on that holy day, St. Peter preached of Christ and his gospel, and 3,000 souls were added to the mystical body of Christ that day through holy baptism. As the inerrant book of Acts records in the New Testament, quote, and they were persevering in the doctrine of the apostles and in the communication of the breaking of bread and in prayers. And all they that believed were together and had all things in common and continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they took their meat with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord increased daily together such as should be saved. Unquote. Pentecost. But was this really a lasting age of unity? peace, and serenity? Hardly. It did not take long before the devils sowed weeds into the garden to mix with the good plants. Judaizers and circumcisers came into the church looking to take away the freedom of the children of God and to drag the church back into Old Testament customs. Then there were those Corinthians mentioned in the scripture that St. Paul and later Pope St. Clement had to deal with schismatics, wishing to always bring division and to encourage spiritual segregation. They were all over the church of Corinth. Rivalries emerged amongst the disciples who preached the saving gospel of Christ. Outright heresies, false teachings were being manifested, which caused St. John in his letters to condemn a number of individuals, even by name. Some early believers were eating, drinking, and parting as a preparation before coming to Holy Mass. Some Christians were overlooking and allowing perverse behaviors that should not even be spoken of in public. Some were slow to give generously to a collection called for by St. Paul for the Church of Jerusalem. And the members of the church soon realized that that original glow of Pentecost Sunday would not necessarily last. And that maintaining this pristine church of the pure would always face the greatest resistance as the children of God deal with the effects of original sin. We're also children of Adam, the first sinner. And you can always tell when a person might be heading in a bad direction, even towards heresy and schism, when he starts exaggerating all the problems within the church, when he starts talking about all the horrible things within the membership of the church and how he has a new vision, how he must establish a pure assembly of the faithful that can recapture that church of the upper room, that church of Jerusalem in the early days. And such a heretic or schismatic was a priest in the early church named Novation. 
The history books tell us about this heretic named Novation. The history books tell us the church experienced nearly 40 years of peace in the third century AD where little or no persecution took place against Catholics by pagan emperors. Things changed, however, when one pagan emperor ordered the death of the Pope, Pope St. Fabian. And with the death of the Holy Father, the priests of Rome gathered, as they always did, to vote for a successor, and they chose a holy priest named Cornelius. But not all were satisfied. They wanted something better, they thought. Some days later, a priest, Novician, set himself up as a rival pope. Novation soon called three bishops to Rome and forced them to ordain him as a bishop. And to ensure the loyalty of his supporters, Novation forced them, when they were receiving Holy Communion, to swear by the blood and body of Christ that they would never support Cornelius. One of the bishops who participated in this illegal ordination, returned to the church bewailing and confessing his sin to Pope Cornelius and begged forgiveness. Certainly then, Novation was a schismatic, breaking the bond of love and unity with Pope Cornelius and setting up a rival assembly. But Novation was not just that. He was also a heretic, a false teacher, called so by many because of his severe rigorous views about the restoration of those believers who had fallen away from the faith during the time of persecution. In other words, those Catholics who had fallen prey to fear during the persecution and had offered incense to the gods were seen as irredeemable. Get them out and don't let them back in. Novation held that idolatry was an unpardonable sin by the church and that the church had no right to restore to communion any who had fallen prey to it. They might repent and be allowed to have a lifelong penance, but their forgiveness was left to God alone and not to the absolution of the church. Severity, rigor, was also seen for other infractions against the Ten Commandments. For crimes such as adultery, for example, pardon could not be granted by the church until the sinner was on his very deathbed. So was the rigor and vinegar and uncompromising Catholicism of novation. But thank the good Lord for men like Pope St. Cornelius, as well as the great bishop and martyr, St. Cyprian, whose feast day we just celebrated on September 16th. These two Orthodox teachers taught that the good Lord came to call sinners to repentance and that our Lord came in his first coming not to condemn, but to save. As St. Cyprian reminded Novation and other like-minded heretics, the creed tells us that we believe in the remission, in the forgiveness of sins through the instrumentality of Holy Mother Church. And St. Cyprian added also that since there is no salvation outside the Catholic Church, it is only proper to bring back the fallen, those who had apostatized and committed idolatry, because if they die outside the church, they are damned. Due to their schism and heresy, Novation and his followers were eventually excommunicated by a synod of bishops. Now, as mentioned earlier, Novation and his supporters held that the church membership must be preserved in all purity without the defilement of those who had not proved steadfast during persecution. And of course, Novation went so far as to deny forgiveness for any serious offense after baptism, such as fornication or idolatry, leaving all that over to God, or perhaps an absolution just before death, if they were lucky. For novation, church membership must always be rigorous and not allow for any laxity, making it an imperative that non-conforming and sinful members be cut off of the body, or at least forcibly segregated 
those who were on the margins, the marginalized, must be forced off the page of the church for only God can forgive them. Now, as we look at the church membership today, in this 21st century, the insistence upon firm, rigorous, and uncompromising Catholicism is largely absent. It seems that one extreme, the rigorist extreme, has been replaced by another extreme, complete laxity. Not only are public adulterers not shunned, but they are even invited to the banquet of the Eucharistic Lord. The whole situation with the COVID-19 and the universal dispensations granted for some lay obligation demonstrate a certain laxity in the Catholic faithful, at least in the West. Catholics who publicly flaunt the laws of God and nature, especially in the political realm, are considered to be in good standing with Holy Mother Church, never corrected. A Pew Research poll taken among Catholics in America just a few days ago, a Pew Research poll taken among Catholics in America who identify themselves as members of one political party shows that 77% of those Catholics from that party agreed with direct abortion in some or even most cases. 77%. Many Catholics in the United States embrace at least some aspects of the rainbow agenda, including the insanity of so-called marriage equality. At the slightest sign of rigor shown within a seminary, and in today's seminaries, he is confronted by superiors. You're a little too harsh in your attitude, your tones. And he's almost always removed from priestly formation. Just too uptight, too rigorous. The church membership has become a big umbrella, a big tent party where everything seems tolerated and rarely, if ever, would there be a penalty, an interdict, or excommunication ever imposed on anyone. No, the schism of, or heresy of Novatianism seems to have no place in the modern day membership of the church which is all-inclusive. And yet, that might be a wrong assessment, for that novation spirit is always present, including within traditional Catholicism. That desire for this pristine church of the pure, where the great unwashed are always pushed away, where various Magdalens are considered irredeemable, or where thieves can never become good thieves, where some consider themselves the elect while labeling others reprobates, that novation-like spirit which seeks to uproot haphazardly the weeds in the field, though some wheat might be pulled up in the process, that's just collateral damage. It is that novation spirit that seeks isolation and segregation from other church membership instead of just seeking insulation from various bad influences while trying to convert others by being with others to try to bring them to tradition. Novationism is seen and that desire to set up a rival church that would be truly traditional without any connection to what is disdainfully referred to as the conciliar church, as if they were actually two churches instead of just the one founded by our dearest Lord in the year 33 AD. Novationism is a condemning spirit. It's a judgmental spirit. It's a spirit that criticizes and mocks instead of praying and making reparation. It's a spirit of vinegar and never honey. They love to harangue. They love to condemn especially against bishops, and they do it by name. They help people, unfortunately, lose piety and reverence for their father. It is a spirit that can ultimately lead to one's damnation, for modern-day novationism could lead you right outside the church. For us who are traditional Catholics, 
let us always love the church as our Holy Mother. And let us realize the church is both a home for saints as well as a hospital for sinners. Let us not become like elder sons who do not welcome prodigal children when they come home to their father's house. Let us realize that the good Lord who founded the church is always in charge. That it is not our job to remake the church according to our own vision. Rather, we pray like the apostles on the Sea of Galilee, that the Lord may arise from his rest and calm the seas and quiet the winds, so that the boat of Peter may safely arrive at that heavenly port with many passengers on board. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.